All right, we are in chapter 38. God finally speaks. Mm. So I'm just going to get right into it. There's a lot that I could say just to start off, but let's just read this. Yeah. Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? And Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment? and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it may take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea, or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. Where is the Where is the way to the dwelling of light, and where is the place of darkness, that you may take it to its territory, that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then, and the numbers of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man, to satisfy the wastes of desolate land and to make the ground sprout with grass? Has the rain a father or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whom's womb did From whose womb did the ice come forth, and who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters have the waters become hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season, or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you establish their rule on earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds, that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightning, that they may go and say to you, Here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts, or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Who can tilt their water, the water skins of, heavens, of the heavens, when the dust runs into a mass, and the clods stick fast together? Lots of um, questions. Lots of questions. <laughs> so, um, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for you to unveil that. Um, one of the things that's that's most apparent is, or that that's just obvious, is God comes and finally speaks to Job. So all this time, Job has been asking for some kind of answer for this question. Right. Has, why, why do the wicked prosper? Or why do the righteous suffer? And then why is, why is this injustice come on me? Um, you know, in, in Job's last speech, um, he asked for an indictment. He's like, just, let me know what I did wrong. Um, and, and I'll wear it like a crown. Then, uh, then Elihu, the fourth person, 
where, where that young man talks and and as he's talking the storm builds in the distance and it kind of sweeps upon them and you know uh so th- this is god answering and it's right. it's overwhelming <laughs> it's and yeah. it's, it's way too much and it's way too it, it's way too intense um and and you know i'm i'm kind of trying to think about like when i first read through this that i remember and it is confusing cuz you're just like here here's god yelling at poor little job <laughs> yeah well you imagine it yelling i mean maybe it's not yelling maybe it's really like mm-hmm. you know maybe it's like um like a master to an apprentice right but like what you're what you're saying is is true it's intense because when you're reading it you're like okay but he's not saying anything he's just asking questions like job asked for an answer and all we're getting is questions (laughs) more questions (laughs) more questions and 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 you're like okay 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 you know like that that's kind of the human um reaction is like yeah okay okay but tell me the answer tell me you know right tell me the thing i can grasp right hold on to and and there's nothing there there there's there's nothing there Mm -hmm. you can't you can't have the question because god actually has the answer (laughs) he's just asking the questions right you can't have anything from that like Mm -hmm. i think that's really interesting you can't take anything from it like i mean i'm not saying we can't take anything yeah yeah yeah. as as a person job's sitting there and he he you know he's been i don't know lamenting and and praying and Mm -hmm. you know mourning for i don't know how many days this is now do you have any idea actually yeah we don't have a sense of time we don't have a sense of time right but it's a long while obviously yep he has nothing left and he's been asking for this face-to-face with his redeemer and suddenly he's got it but he's just getting like bombarded it's not even yeah questions. it's not even with the redeemer it's just face to face with god well yeah right that's yeah. what i was saying. but yeah yeah face to face with god and um and he's just getting questions like he's not he's not getting mm-hmm. any so any so uh chesterton in that essay um on introduction to the book of job that i also recorded mm-hmm. chesterton says of this he's like um god comes not to give answers but to propound them if if job was asking some large questions mm-hmm. that don't have answers god was going to ask bigger questions with more But he's, he, he was going to ask bigger and wilder questions than Job ever thought to well, that, uh, that's, ask. You know, that gets to, I don't know which conversation it was. Maybe it was Elihu, um, where I said something like, Job was the man who, when he opened his mouth at the gates, it was like the latter rain, right? Mm-hmm. He had all this wisdom. And I don't know how I put it in that conversation, but something like, he needed somebody who could one up him like he's he Mm -hmm. he was asking very deeply profound questions and so whoever showed up needed to ask even more profound questions yeah that's interesting yeah and and um chesterton also says if god is um god is explicit to the point of violence (laughs) that that whatever is happening cannot be explained. Now, and, do we get Tim, that? Tim Keller, Tim Keller had a nice sermon on on this too, and he's mm-hmm. Tim Keller talks about how God, how Job wants an explanation and he wants vindication. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and for for the explanation, God God basically says, "I cannot explain it to you." Right. 
Now, the, you know, this can be kind of, you know, for people wanting an explanation, <laughs> this, this could be kind of like, oh, great. All right. So we just, this is, God just comes and makes things more complicated, makes it. But um, Chesterton says that, which, which I kind of agree with is like his, his lack of being able to provide an answer is an answer. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's something like, there's something more wonderful going on here than you can, than you can imagine. And, and like you, you hinted at that, like Job is asking these more profound questions than his friends thought to ever ask. And he's in, and, and Job's like, you're not helping me. Like I'm, I, I would I'm beyond I, you. Yeah. You, and you are trying to drag me back down to, you know, just supporting your doctrine and, and it's motivated by your fear. Um, and, and Job has this integrity about him and, and Job is fierce in defending his integrity and, and fierce in, in defending his, and it's all unseen. Like, how do you defend that? Like yeah. his friends are basically like Job, and the they, evidence they, for, for your wickedness is your suffering right. that all this happened to you. You, you can't just keep in, but Job is insistent. He's righteous. He's innocent that he has this integrity yeah. and, and he's asking these questions and it's, it's interesting how how God, when God comes, so this we have to remember Job twenty eight and the hidden wisdom of God. I know I'm thinking about it the whole time you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's this idea of there's this hidden wisdom of God. Like where yeah. is it? There's the wisdom of man, which is like the wisdom of Job and his friends. But Job has found the limit of that wisdom, and he's like, why do the righteous suffer? So. What what's the wisdom behind that? And and God comes and almost mirroring Job, Job in his intensity right. and defending his own integrity. And then God comes in a in his in in, in intensity to defend his the okay. hidden wisdom that it can't explain. Like yeah. Just like Job couldn't explain his integrity and his righteousness to his friends, despite oh, appearances, God is also defending his hidden wisdom and his right. motivations despite appearances. Right, right. Be- because the friends, like the friends, ask that- Job, Job, explain this how this happens, and Job's like, I don't know why it happens. I all I know is this that I'm innocent, and they're like whatever yeah and then job will say something like you know god has dealt with me unjustly god has has um done these things to me and then god comes and god has something hidden about him as well that that he's going to defend and and chesterton does a great job of saying how like god is he's exercising humility because he's come like Job wants to meet God at the gate to sort this out. And God is actually coming to meet him. (laughs) And yeah. And and this is why I don't think, you know, we often, because it's a whirlwind and then he says, pull up your pants, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and so we get this image of Job. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah. And we have a man in, uh, you know, you know, old man in the sky version of God anyways, right? Mm. But what if, what what happens to the dialogue here if we tone it down a notch, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Like, just imagine. So, like you just said, God comes in humility. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, let's imagine a Christ-like figure. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yep. And, 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 and then he says these things in a gentle mentoring kind of, you know, wise old sage way, like, you know, Mm -hmm. the the Kung Fu series, Grasshopper. (laughs) 
like no parents. it changes everything mm-hmm. you know it really does like if you if you want to approach this as you know god going pull up your pants i'm gonna teach you a lesson or two right like, with arrogance really with arrogance mm-hmm. right you don't know anything and i'm gonna really make you make you feel it you know right right um but I don't think that's who God is. So I just reject that. <laughs> well, I don't, I Honestly. think it's a superficial reading because you, people say like, Oh, God's showing him his power. And you're yeah. like, well, I, I guess that's there, but that I, for me, that's like the most superficial layer. Like God's asking him to consider the wisdom of these things. Yes. And, and, and so, um, he's asking Job to go deeper than he's gone already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and it's already something that God has appeared in talking to Job. This is what Job oh, requested. Like yes. face you to know. face. Yep. And he doesn't he doesn't address anybody else either, which is no. also really important, I think. Yeah. Because nobody else really wanted a face to face with him. <laughs> They're all like, don't say that. Yeah. Right? What a, Elihu, when he ended his thing, was like, "Was like, how could I speak before him? Do you want me to be swallowed up?" Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. No, they're terrified. They don't. They don't want. They don't want. That's why they're like, "Job, shut your mouth. Shut up." Yeah, you're gonna call down God, and then what? We're all gonna die, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, right. right. And and so they don't even think. They don't even think. Like, there's nothing good about God in that scenario to me. There's nothing good there. Mm-hmm. You know, like you have to believe that God is good if you want to meet him. Like, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, like it's like it's like that story I told about the, you know, looking for the elephants, right? We get to that stand of trees and it's just demolished. It looks like like a giant cat, cat you know. Right. Um, I don't think I want to see the elephants. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to. No, I, I don't want to meet them. <laughs> I'm good. Right. I'm fine with the, the discs yeah. and the sand and the laying down trees. That's good for me. I'm, you yeah. know, needing them now. <laughs> yeah. And and so, you know, if I think about that example, I would have to, if I pursued it, I would have to know enough about elephants to know that they weren't going to hurt me. And then I would continue looking for them. Mm-hmm. Right. But um, with the little that I knew, as far as I could tell, as far as I could see, they were going to kill me. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And and so it's like that for the, these people, right? They, and But Job knows something else. He has to in order to call mm-hmm. for this meeting. Job, and this, is, this goes to the... God, on God, right? Yeah, this goes to the bravery and courage and tenacity of Job. Yeah, yeah. And it reminds me of when Moses asks God, let me see your face. Let me see your glory. And God no. basically says, you can't handle it. I'm going to I'm going to hide you in the rock. Right. I'm going to pass by and then you'll be able to see my back. But I heard it explained once and I really like this that that God says, you'll see what follows in my wake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The energies yeah. Right, right. You'll see That's everything that happens as I go by, right. and and but I, this is kind of what my essence. And and this is why God is talking about creation. He's mm-hmm. he's like because it's like the the thing the thing you're asking, Job. I I can't explain. So so <laughs> so behold. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so here's a thought. Like when you mentioned Moses, Mm -hmm. I thought right away that the thing that I love about these um, great men in, in, you know, in the scriptures, Moses and Noah and Mm -hmm. uh, Abraham and Joseph. I think of Joseph a lot in this regard. David. They have this really grounded relationship to God. Yeah. Right? Like, it's super real. 
they can argue, they can, you know, they can, they can ask for things that maybe they shouldn't ask for, mm -hmm. you know, um, they can rail against God, like, you know, like I think of Moses spending all that time on the mountain and then coming down and smashing the stones. If he was afraid of God, he wouldn't have smashed those stones. That's mm -hmm. one thing I thought of when I read that. I was like, he'd be like, oh, my God, you know, carrying right. them like they were. If he dro drops right, them, right. right, because God wrote them. Okay. Right. Like, hello. Right. So, but no, he just got, drops them. He just loses it. Well, because this is where I get the idea that these men were friends of God's. Mm -hmm. They were friends and a friend knows, mm -hmm. right? That he always has that access to his friend. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so they, they, the relationship that they have with God seems so, I don't want to say collegial because there is a lot of awe and a lot of reverence and a lot of, you know, being overwhelmed fear even <laughs> right, right at, at times yeah but when it gets down into the into the nitty-gritty of of their dialogue with each other and their relationship with each other it's so real mm -hmm. it's so real that david can say yay though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i know that you're with me mm -hmm. right 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 so um that I find really interesting. And everybody else is like, oh, no, let's not talk to that guy because he could just kill kill us with a laser look. <laughs> right. 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 We're just going to go poof and we're gone. Yep. And all these other friends of God, they seek the, these this mm -hmm. relationship, right? They want the mm -hmm. time together. They want, they want to be able to share all their sorrow and all their all their joy and everything. Yep. Right? Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyways, I went off on a little tangent, but no, that I, I think it, it, Job is one of the great men of the scriptures. Right. Like it's clear. Mm -hmm. it, it's oh. just, it's just clear. Um, Even if he is fictional. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, no, it seriously. Doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter. Okay. No. No. Okay. So maybe this will be a good point to just kind of sort of get into some of this and yeah, let's do it. pay attention to some specific details. Details. So the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind. We talked about Job being answered. Um, the whirlwind, we've talked about this before, but I don't think we did on the podcast. No. Which is, uh, so you remember like as as Job and his friends are bantering back and forth, they're like, they're like, oh, you, you old windbag. <laughs> yeah. That's our. Yeah. But they'll be like, oh, your words are just a great wind, and it's yeah. like an insult. It's like it's nothing but just. Um, it seems air to get thrown around, around by both sides of the argument too. Like Job says it to yep. them, they say it to Job. Like yep. it, it's, it's really um, stands out. Yeah. So so there's all this wind, and and it's important to. Um, well, yeah, but but the conversation between the friends and Job, that's that's the whirlwind. It is. It's it's the going back and forth of speech and the it it had, you know, reached reached a point where this whirlwind forms and that's where God answers out of was out of um out of that Job whirlwind. and his friends, you know, grappling with each other and grappling with the problem and um and and so I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, the world. But there, we, but there is a storm approaching, though. Mm -hmm. Too right. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like, it's like this. See, I get I I get a picture. I think I mentioned this yesterday to you. I get a picture of two whirlwinds, right? Mm -hmm. And they're and they're mirroring each other. Like I I had this idea mm -hmm. that. Because like you just said that, like Job is asking God all these questions and then God comes back and he mirrors that back to Job with, with more know. questions. Okay. And so Job and his friends are creating this whirlwind of, you know, chaotic dialogue. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's actually reciprocally narrowing mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. into like from the friend's point of view, like the way the friends are, they reciprocally narrow down into abuse. Well, that's what happens when a whirlwind touches the ground. It's very destructive Mm -hmm. at the tip, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's moving around and it's just being abusive. You call it that, you know, an abusive whirlwind. (laughs) It's an interesting metaphor. Tornado. (laughs) So, so they've got their whirlwind going, and then God comes in a bigger one, right? <laughs> and and I see, I see that I'm trying to think of how I can explain this. It's not two whirlwinds side by side in my they're mind. They're mirrored to each other. They're like it, they're mirrored. So you've got two tips touching, like an hourglass. Which is the hourglass, right? Which is a chiastic structure. Which is, yes, the chiastic structure. So that, that's that's just something to think about. I don't know how true that is. Yeah, either. yeah. No, but there, I mean, there's something to that mirroring that God's doing of of what Job's doing. And that yeah. that's just interesting. Okay, so, so God says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? I love so, that. But so, that's isn't that said though by um Job or one of his friends at some point? Um yes. I, I think uh multiple times well Elihu definitely does in 34 35. He says Job speaks without knowledge, his words lack insight. Um yeah, but I think he also Job- says Job opens his mouth in vain and multiplies words without knowledge. But what God is saying here is that is he, he's okay. So he's saying, who is that the dark darkens counsel? So darkening means to hide. It, it actually means to obscure. Okay. Um, and then the counsel is advice or plan. It, it'd be like, and and this is like the the wisdom of God, the hidden wisdom of God. So there's something obscuring it, and and. Some of what is obscuring it is is what they're all talking about. And it's for me oh, it, it's that it's that there's this been this reciprocal narrowing on the idea of justice. Yeah. For Job and his friends. And and this idea of and and this seems to be you know it, it's not totally clear here and i don't think it's it's exactly this but it, it's something like why are you guys talking about justice it says nothing to do with justice you know for me it's it's like you guys are all missing the point yeah yeah um and yeah. and just like you're talk like the 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 whole world has come down where job is focused on this one point it's been reciprocally mm-hmm. narrowed yeah um and you'll you'll this is this is actually what happens in trauma and uh addiction and but especially trauma where where the the traumatic event becomes so um like the person becomes so hyper focused on it that it basically takes over everything and they can't think about anything else or do anything else or like it, it, it consumes them. Their whole yeah, world. Yeah, is- I always get this. I, I always tell people that if you, if you follow, like if you focus on, like I've had friends who, let's say they have like a, a bad relationship with one of their parents or something, mm-hmm. and they, you know, they, uh, there was this time when everybody was talking about setting boundaries. I gotta set boundaries. I gotta, you know, and I just thought that's right. just bullshit. You know, no, we don't set boundaries. <laughs> yeah, we actually yeah. want to touch one another. Okay, mm-hmm. always. Um, and and I didn't, I didn't know how to explain that to, to them. But the, anyway, they, you know, they would say, "Oh, my mother is this, or my dad is that, or my brother, or whoever." Right? Mm-hmm. Usually, a family member, because that's really hard to. You can't avoid contact right. with the family member. And, and, I, and they would focus in on this, this characteristic of this person, right? Mm-hmm. That they couldn't handle that mm-hmm. triggered them or whatever the case might be. 
And I would say, and, and I would watch them. And the more that they did that, the more that they actually became that. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was a really, really interesting little phenomenon. I saw it in many, many people. Yep. And I, I realized, okay. And then Peterson was talking about all this targeting and focusing and eyes and all that stuff that I like to talk about because, mm -hmm. because of that. Because that's kind of what I saw happening. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was reciprocal narrowing, right? Right. But that's what it was. Like they were so hyper focused on the thing that they ended up walking right into it. Like the, it, it was a, it was a kind of an incarnation, mm -hmm. if you want to, if you want to think about it like that. Yep. Right. So they have this this characteristic that they can't take. Mm -hmm. They hate. And they move right into it, and and they embody it. Yeah, it was you know it was totally bizarre, and I just thought, okay, that's not what I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, well, I that's that's sort of the danger. Reciprocally of, widen. <laughs> well, that that's why that's why trauma and and is so kind of destructive to people is because right. they get stuck and then they become destructive themselves. And um, you know, I, I'm not saying that Job is doing that, but he may be in danger of that. It's in some regard or another. And um, what, what's interesting about this is that there's this reciprocal narrowing and just like your two whirlwinds, um, yeah. God's going to blow open the whole world again to Job. Right. So, right. So he, wi he widens it right up out again. Yeah. And in, um, oh man, I forget his name in the ethics of beauty book. Um, Timothy Pististus. Yep, Timothy Pististus. I don't know why I knew that. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> you remember. <laughs> but in the first, in the first several chapters of of his book, he talks about this. He talks about trauma, mm -hmm. and then he talks about the solution to it. Because we, in in all our modern psychology and stuff, we still don't necessarily know how to hand like treat trauma in a successful way. I love how he talked about. It. You shared some of it with me. Yeah, and and so he basically says that that like say someone goes to war, they they're involved in a bunch of stuff, either personally or it happens to them or stuff they do that that they didn't expect that they could do, and now they have now they are suffering from trauma, and so they come they come back from war, and like w what do you do? He's he's like they need to be brought back into a world again. They can't be left isolated because that trauma right. can consume them yeah. Um, and they'll become totally focused on that. And they'll start to do the things that you were talking about, embody something that's destructive. Yeah. And so, and so what you need to do is, is you need to bring them back into a community. You need to bring them back into, into feasts and celebrations and um, different times of the year. And so the, the idea you know, some of it is is they've got to talk it out, but even more so than that, they have to have actually be brought into like this open space where there's more possibilities, yeah. and then then they they can, and also talk. more connection, Jess. I think right. They they have to have something more than than this trauma mm -hmm. that they've sort of focused in on, and then what he says is like this thing doesn't just go away; it doesn't magically disappear. The but but what it does is it. He talks about it in terms of having a place to live. Is it? Do you think it dissipates because of it gets distributed over? I don't. I don't think I. You know the way I picture it. He 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 talks about it as it has its place to live in this larger world. Then right, right. Um, and I almost think of it as like like it's its own living thing. It's like a little yeah. personality or a little creature. Yeah. And it has to have like its own place to live in the world. It can't just be boxed up and caged up and and stirring whatever. It's it's got to be a part of a of a bigger thing, a bigger picture. And well, see and, the thing. The reason I ask about whether or not it gets dissipated by distribution in in I mean, in, in community is because mm -hmm. of the idea of bearing one another's burdens. Mm -hmm. Right. So, like, if well, you he, he talks about that. Yeah, well, in in different ways, what comes to mind is that 
is that like, as you're like talking with someone about it, like as you talk through these things and talking doesn't necessarily always help, but most of the time it's, it's good to be able to talk through these things. Um, then like you can say something and then someone else can, someone else can empathize with that and then respond in the correct way. Like that they won't be able to. So, like, so maybe, maybe they'll, t- they'll say something sorrowful. They'll just say it straight faced yeah. and the other person will break down in tears. Right. You know, or. Which means they've taken some of that on the weight. Right. Or, or maybe they're broken down in tears and the other person is being courageous and encouraging them on. Right. So, right. so it, it's compensating for whatever they're kind of stuck in either, you know, um, and, and then giving like a different way to react. So that in that way, I see like bearing burdens and stuff. Have you so, ever watched, have you ever seen an Amish barn raising video? It's mm-hmm. just phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what the, you know, the things I could get done on my farm in a day with these mm-hmm. people. <laughs> like a community of human beings can pick up a building yep. and move it. Yep. A big one. I've seen them. <laughs> it's crazy. It's wild. So, you know, if this is, I think visually, like this is a manifestation of, of what we do when we bear one another's burdens, right? Like it, suddenly it becomes light and easy. It's not like mm-hmm. it goes away, but it's, it's somehow, because I think that every, Every relationship that we have, even fleeting ones, okay, are transformative. Mm-hmm. I see the way the way I see people interacting with each other is like they enter each other's force fields. Mm-hmm. And 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 when they do, they share something immediately, right? And and that doesn't like that that uh what's the word I'm looking for here? Like that interaction or not that interaction, but that contact that's made, that thing that manifests between two people, it doesn't disappear. Mm-hmm. It lives somewhere. Right. And it lives in each one of those people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Forever. Mm-hmm. Forever. And so every time we meet someone, we have a transformative experience. Every time we interact with anybody, we are being transformed Mm -hmm. and we're also transforming other people. Now that can be negative and it can be positive. Right. We see that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. This is why we need Christ to be born in us. So that, so that when we enter other people's force fields, they are transformed positively. Always. Right. Yeah. Yep. That's good. That's really good. Okay, so we who <laughs> is this the darkens council by words without <laughs> we got we've got two. we got two verses in. <laughs> um oh, that's okay, Jess. If we have to do this for four weeks, that's fine with me. It's fine with me too. Um so I th- you know <laughs> so so he he's he's saying that there's something hidden here that you guys are not the, the words you're using is not getting to it's something it's like actually that. dark and like you're right. dark. It's been obscure. You're darkening right. it. Yeah. Like you're actually darkening it, you know, and don't you it, think? who yeah. is it? Who's darkening it? Like they're, he's making God, God's making them responsible for actually darkening. <laughs> right. Darkening the answer. Yeah. It's what, what they're doing is, is obscuring. Mm-hmm. And and God's going to start like even though God's pointing asking questions, He cannot explain it. He's pointing towards it this right. through throughout His speech. Well, He's this is just I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but I just mm. wanted to kind of refer back to that thing you said about seeing Him from the back, as in the wake, right? The mm-hmm. energies of God. Mm-hmm. It seems to me like He's describing that wake, right? He's describing the energies. Like that's all God can do really is talk about his wake. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
Because yeah, because that's what we know. We can't see his face. Yeah, because if we see his face, we'll we'll die. Yeah. So he says, "Okay, dress for action like a man." I, the the words there is like gird up thy thy loins. I can read it in King James. I got the original here. Oh yeah. <laughs> Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Yeah. So so um the girding up of the loin like that would be to like Job is is has been crushed and he's in the ashes. Yeah. And, and you know, this is but but Job's been also courageous and brave. And so this is encouraging Job to stand up, get ready, let's go. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's beautiful. So there's something there's something like that. And also He's actually, you know, sorry, Jess, but yeah. He says like a man. Job doesn't feel like a man right now. Right. right. Well, and it's not just like a man, it's like a valiant man, a warrior. Right. God's giving him dignity, Jess. Yeah, abs- absolutely. Yeah. So then um he says I will I will question you and you shall answer me. Now you're going to be able to make it through this. <laughs> I'm going to make it. I'm going to be like halfway. I'm going to be partly in tears the whole time. <laughs> it's okay. I'm I'm kind of, you know, feeling it. So maybe okay. both of us will be <laughs> and I can't explain it, Sherry. <laughs> It'll be interesting. All right. So the I will question you and you make <clears throat> make it known to me. Chesterton point says that I like I like how he frames this. He's like he's like in in the process of like a like a court case or whatever, which is kind of how the book is there's a little bit of like a legal framework of this where mm-hmm. like Job is requesting that God come and bring an indictment and he signed the papers and da, da, da. So, so now Job is, or God is coming and he wants to cross examine Job for, for his side of the case. Right. And, and uh, so God is playing, the, do playing the game, which is interesting. Job set up sort of this legal framework. God says, you're, you're obscuring the the what's going on mm-hmm. but nonetheless i'm going to play i'm going to play it and i'm going to now ask questions and you and you answer okay so the first question he has hey, where you were know, you you know just just want to say this can you imagine if god asks you like do you think that he cares about what you think? I do, actually. When he says, I'm going to ask you a question now, I want you to answer. It, this sounds like a teacher to a student. Okay. Like I, yeah. I'm, I have been teaching you all this time. Okay. And now let's see where you're at. I'm going to ask you yeah. a question and now you give me the answer. Like this is, this is toning it down. Okay. Getting away from this mm-hmm. wrathful, angry old man in the sky. With the booming voice, right? Right. And and taking it down and and hearing God as um as a loving father, really. Okay. Well I, it, I think that's really the only description for God. Yeah. Is. And and then the the rabbis, the rabbis would ask questions of their students. I know. They're, I know. they're rarely like just spelling things out for them or, no. or i mean they do that too but but like you know you see jesus or or whoever like someone comes up ask him a question you just ask them a question right back like, hey i i i homeschooled and most of the time that i interacted with my kids <laughs> you're asking was, them questions i just ask them questions because i don't know what they know yeah right so i have to find out where they're lacking and if I don't know, if the only way I can do that is ask some questions and then find the holes in their, in their knowledge and fill that hole. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and it wasn't like, I wasn't drilling them or anything, you know, mm-hmm. just asking sincere questions. Um, 
it also it also makes you think for yourself okay if someone just just shows up and starts lecturing you Mm -hmm. you just tune out you're like but when they start asking you questions your mind starts going clink clink it's it's engaging right and um yeah anyway i'll just leave it at that we better get past yeah i think god is like (laughs) (laughs) well it's it's like god is seriously asking the questions to him i think he is i think so too and it's not a veiled attempt to just brag no that's why i made the point yeah that it engages your brain when someone asks you a question and and this and it's also (laughs) getting joke like so yeah the whole world is going to open up to job through yeah. these questions mm-hmm. so where were you when i laid the foundation of the earth tell me if you have understanding mm-hmm. who determined its measurements surely you know who stretched the line upon it on what were its bases sunk and who laid its cornerstone its cornerstone okay. this i just want to say before you before you re- read anymore when when that when you were reading that it reminded me of Blake's painting of mm-hmm. of your reason mm-hmm. with the compass. Okay. That's your reason, actually. And so just to explain to anybody watching, your reason is a god of this world that Blake talks about. And um I don't want to give away anything about him, but he has to do with rationality. And so he's always he's often measuring Hmm. Okay. So God starts with that. He starts with measuring mm-hmm. here. And I think I'm just like throwing this out here. I haven't thought about it much, but I think that this has something to do with this logical, rational, you know, God appeals to that very at the very start, right? Because that's where we we operate out of that. Mm-hmm. So he's yeah, anyway. Oh, no, that's good. And when the morning stars, well, let's just talk about this first part. So where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Um, so it's talking about the fundamental things, like the thing that everything is built upon. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then he asks, who determined its measurements? Um that's interesting talking about like measuring the entire earth, like planning it out. Like our, already we're, we're seeing like the limits of our own reason and how to, yeah. How do you plan something like that out? It's, it's, yeah, they were lucky if they could measure out a city. Right. Yeah. Or a country, maybe the borders or something. Right. And then, I mean, we got it. And then what were its bases sunk? So, so like a f- the, the idea would be like, you'd have these pillars that would go down to the bedrock that could provide like the firm foundation, like the, well, the stability for the foundation. Right. Right. And, and so he he's like saying like, it's not only like what's the foundation of creation on what are the pillars of foundation attached to like what right, right. what is that below that do you know again, do you know what that is yeah and again it, it's that really deep below the surface stuff too yeah we're we're right into that whole hidden wisdom of god stuff and and this is you know people read job and they're like well it must be job god's just showing job his power in order to humble him and like i don't think so this isn't a question about power it's a it's a question of wisdom mm-hmm. and everything's pointing towards that and yeah and he says right away he's like on what is everything based what what is what is that thing um yeah. and and this is that thing that god's going to point to and because it, it's unexplainable right <laughs> So in in verse seven, when he says, uh, when the morning stars sang together and all the sun shouted shouted for joy, already God is pointing at this is something good. 
mm-hmm. when the foundations, when the when the when the when the bases were sunk, when its cornerstone was laid, that's the first stone that's laid. And yeah. the cornerstone is important because it's going to determine how true in the right, right. You know, because everything's ends. based on it. The walls going out and yeah, the walls yeah. going up. Um. So everyone shouted for joy when that happened. Wow. So already at the foundation, we have something where the sons of God are shouting for joy. That's um, kind of interesting. I didn't know that about the cornerstone. Mm-hmm. That it that it that it sets the the trueness of the of the building. Yeah, you line every other stone. I mean, yeah, well, you know, everything will be based on that because it's the first one you laid. Right. Okay. And then there, there's also you know, on what were its bases sunk. There, there's also, I think Yosef said this wouldn't be true for uh, the Jewish people. Like this was writ, Job was written by uh, someone who's Jewish, po- probably Moses. And then, um, but Ju- Job himself isn't Jewish, but, but there's always, there's all kinds of traditions about putting something underneath the cornerstone or under the mm-hmm. foundation it's like symbolically significant right so oh, yeah. like some something important like uh mm-hmm. in in las vegas they were building the nfl stadium i don't know if this is true or not but <laughs> there's a rumor that one of the construction workers there is a chiefs fan and so he buried he put a chiefs flag underneath the concrete slab at the 50 yard line <laughs> so that, like even if it isn't true it's it's still a rumor and like people understand the significance of burying okay, the here's, flag here's under even, the <laughs> under the field even more bizarre burying of something under a field. Yeah. um in in the in the british isles i think it's at the eighth century maybe it's the seventh i'm not sure but there's a saint uh columba i think his name is and mm-hmm. um he he started a monastery on the isle of iona and um when they got there uh there were some buildings like falling down like you know and, and it's very rudimentary like it was super rudimentary okay like i think they were stone buildings and they just mm-hmm. built from what they had and the locals there had been pagan and um every time they built the the chapel these monks it would fall over and the, and the and the local pagan said, "Well, you have to kill someone and bury them under it. You have to make a human sacrifice. Otherwise, right. it won't. The building won't stay up." Right. Okay. And the monks thought, "No, we're not doing that." So they kept at it, and it kept falling over. And so, one of them, an elderly one, an elderly monk, put himself forward, and he said, "I'll I'll go," but they couldn't kill him. So they buried him alive under the building hmm. and that never fell down. And it stands to this day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Isn't that a crazy story? It's crazy. Well, there's I've, story- I've, I've, I've heard people talk about it um, on YouTube mostly, but you know, visited there and they, and they can just sense this person's presence there. You know, I can't oh, remember yeah. the guy's name anymore. He has a name, yeah. but. Anyway, I just thought I'd tell you that story because that really blew me away. Yeah. Well, and it gets to the point where like, you know, even though we build a building and and we have like a physical foundation, the building like is built on a purpose, you know, like like mm-hmm. you build a stadium. I mean, right. sure, there, there's the physical building of the stadium, but it's actually built on the love of sport or whatever, of football. Yeah. Like that's what the building's built on. Yeah. Or, it, it's a temple in a way. Yeah. Every, it always has a purpose. The library is built on, you know, it's going to be a, a place of knowledge. That's mm-hmm. what the library is built on. And so yeah, I think yeah. that's what what God is getting at. He's getting at these deeper things. And, and for, you know, for Christians, like it's just blatantly obvious Who's the cornerstone? Who's the foundation mm-hmm. of all? Well, there's creation. reference to that, right? Oh, I don't yeah. know if it's reference to Job specifically in the New Testament, but it refers. I think it's Paul, right? That calls Christ the cornerstone. Mm-hmm. Saint Paul. Yep. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. 
and that cr- Christ is crucified before the foundations of the world. Right. So, so like underneath everything is Christ and not just Christ, but Christ crucified. Right. Um, and so this is clearly like <laughs> God, God is challenging Job to look at, at his wisdom in, in these deeper things mm-hmm. right off the gate, right out of the bat. And then the sons of God are shouting for joy at this. Whatever, whatever God has done, whatever mm-hmm. he can't explain, the, the morning stars and the sons of God are shouting for joy. Right. Beautiful. Okay. Verse eight. <laughs> we're, we're never going to make it through. We're just zooming chapters. along here. I know. So who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? Um, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. So, okay. Four through seven, we have God laying the foundations. God's building something. Mm-hmm. In in eight, we have the birth of the sea. Isn't that what what's day one and day two in Genesis? Is this what this is representative of? It it doesn't correspond like one to one. Okay, okay. Um, but the God's speech in Job is one of three major creation um, stories accounts in the Old Testament. So first okay. one's in Genesis, then there's this one in Job. Uh, Job 38 through 42, God's speech, and then it's Psalm 104. And we may have to read Psalm 104 at some point. Oh, yeah. Because, because it's it's exactly this. Um it's it's different though in really really interesting ways. Okay. But I want you to notice how God's talking about things. He's talking about things not in terms of 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 justice, right and wrong. He's immediately talking about uh, creation, making the world, and it. And it, you know, for for me, this is this is significant. This isn't just arbitrary. Like God's just not like, well, I've got to give some answer that He can't. Well, I'll just tell Him about creation then. Like <laughs> God's God's through this, He's pointing at the reasons. Mm, okay. He's pointing to the reasons. Um. So, so already, you know, and so we have the sea who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from its womb. So we have the sea being born. Yeah. And so there's some womb (laughs) where the sea was birthed out of, like, where is the womb of the sea? Like, this is getting to the, like, another thing you like, like, where was the sea born from? Because in the, you know, in ancient cosmology, um, you, f- you first have the sea, and this is true in, in Genesis. In Genesis 1, it's like the earth was formless and void, and the spirit mm-hmm. hovered over the, the, the deep, the waters, the sea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and then the it's water, out. You know. yeah. yeah. Well, and it's out of the sea that everything <laughs> is created. The, God separates the sea from the dry land. Um, and so that's, that's what he's saying there is... Um, but he's saying before the land and sea are separated, he's like the sea is born out of out of some womb, and then yeah, and it's a good metaphor because I mean when a when a child is being born, the first thing that happens is the waters break. Okay, hey, <laughs> I mean it's right, to- yeah, but mm-hmm. but here even even the sea, like he says, made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. So here, God, you you can picture him he he takes the sea up and wraps it up yeah in the clouds <laughs> yeah in which the clouds which is condensation <laughs> 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 just get a little scientific there <laughs> but but you can just sense the care in which no, god I, yeah, yeah. already and and the sea was not something that the that people of that time were like People are afraid of the sea. It was the place where you can't live. Yeah. You know, it you know, if you go out on a boat, you know, there's the storm and takes you out. But but um here here God is with little baby sea. Yeah. And wrapping it up. 
And then, and then in the next verse, it says prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far you come and no farther here shall, shall your proud waves be stayed. And so this is the separation of the sea from the land. Yeah. That's because he's, he, it's like, I'm going to place limits on you. See, <laughs> so you don't destroy everything. Um, so yeah, which so, is also care. Mm-hmm. That's also care. Like we think about, oh no, limitations. Oh, stay away from it. Yeah. But what about everybody else on the other side of the sea? Right? Like they need to be looked after too. Yep. So yeah, and so you see uh, God swaddling the sea, but yeah. then it's also it's still the terrible sea. Yeah. That needs to have these boundaries okay. set so that it and and you can even see God do this with Satan in, in the beginning. He's like, he's like, you can, you can do this, but don't touch him. Mm-hmm. And and then Satan comes back and they have their other exchange. And he's like, you can, you can inflict him with, you can inflict his body, but don't kill him. So you can see how God's setting these boundaries for, for, for purposes. Yeah. Um, that goes back to what I said at the beginning, just when all my, all, all my friends were going through these boundary setting stages. And I was like, oh, I was just so tired of it because it it, it it just sounded so selfish. And and I thought, well, what about the person that you're setting the boundary from? Like, don't they get don't they get to be loved? Don't mm-hmm. they get to be transformed by you? Mm-hmm. Only the people you like get to be transformed by you. And so what's kind of interesting here, I have to say this because I just I said that in the beginning mm-hmm. um, and I'm not a fan of boundaries in relationships i do understand i do understand that there are some people that you cannot engage with like you can't Mm -hmm. do this but you can Mm -hmm. do this okay and that's that's how the sea is it meets the dry Mm -hmm. land right but it doesn't engulf it so i just wanted to say that no that's good Okay. Verse 12. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Okay. So this is like, there's there's a little play on words because it's like, since your day began, have you started the days? Yeah. 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 (laughs) You know, um, (laughs) have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? So, So this is, so all right, so we have the foundations laid. We the sea has been born, and now the sun is rising. This almost sounds like 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 an adult trying to explain things to a little child. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, you know, it does. Like, and then the sea was born, and I wrapped it up in little swaddling clothes. Right, like right. This is what it. They. It's all relatable. Mm-hmm. To Job, he can imagine. But that, like, you couldn't imagine if God described cre- creation happening the way He saw it. We can imagine it. He's using language that Job can relate to, mm-hmm. because he wants Job to see it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Um. Okay, cause the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. Okay, so this is interesting because we have a mention of the wicked now. And um, let me look up something real fast. 24, 13 through. Okay, let me read this. This is what Job said. Remember when he was empathizing with the the uh, the wicked, the wicked. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is chapter twenty four, verse thirteen. Uh, I'll read through a few verses. All right, I don't know where to stop. All right, I'll just start, and then I'll stop when. There are those who rebel against the light, who are not acquainted with its ways and do not stay in its paths. The murderer rises before its light. It is light that he may kill the poor and needy, and in the night he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer also waits for the the twilight, saying, No eye will see me. 
and he veils his face. In the dark, they dig through houses. By day, they shut themselves up, and they do not know the light. For deep darkness is morning to all of them. They are friends with the terrors of the deep darkness. Um, well, Yeah, that's what I wanted to read. That's Job? That's Job saying those things. Okay. And that wasn't actually the point where he was. Empath- this, this is at the end of when he's empathizing with the with um, the poor and the outcast. Okay. So he's talking about the, the oh. wicked that are af- afflicting the yeah. uh, the poor and outcast. So he says, um, so he's talking about these wicked people and how they're doing all this in darkness. Yeah. And so this is this is sort of God's answer. In, in a way to the wicked he's he's like i caused the i caused the dawn to rise um and the use light, the light to light come on. every day the light comes and the wicked hide that it may that it might take hold of the ends of the earth that, and the wicked might be shaken out of it i see myself with a carpet <laughs> yeah that's what the dawn is doing it's picking mm-hmm. up the ends of the earth and shaking, exposing them. Yep, and now they go away. Yep. During the daylight, it's you can like I've been in some sketchy places in the world. Um oh, yeah. And and during daytime yeah. almost anywhere are- during the day, you're you you're okay. It's re- it's really rare during the daytime when you're like, you just can't go there. There's a, there's a reason why, you know, sketchy it, pe- people are compared to cockroaches. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. And then those same places, they're just like, after after it gets dark, you ha- you cannot be here. Exactly. And it is just exactly what, and, and this is one of God's answers that he's giving about wickedness. He's like, he's like, I cause the sun to come up every day. It's interesting when you think about that, because... People, let's say they're criminals, okay, and they only they sleep all day and come out at night. Mm-hmm. Are they really? Are they really aware that they are covering themselves with darkness? Because because they know that mm-hmm. what they're doing is wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's interesting. Then the next verse. Uh, it is changed like clay under the seal. So it's talking about the landscape, the the earth. The earth is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. So, so uh, clay under a seal would be like I was gonna ask um, you that. like you would you would seal up like a like a letter or something. You you'd put a piece of clay on it. You we're more familiar with wax and seals. Oh, okay. but then you take your seal and you press it into it and it would yeah. make an indentation that would be like your signature. Right. Yeah. So, and you can imagine just how, when the light, you know, when it's dark out before dawn, there's no, there's no differentiation in the landscape. It's all right. one sort of, you yeah. know, it's, it's the clay before. And then like, as the light comes, the light comes up, it brings out all those details, just like the the seal comes down on the on the right, clay right. or the wax, okay. and 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 but it's a signature too, which is which is interesting. So mm-hmm. like, as the light shines on the landscape, it's it's God's signature, mm-hmm. um, and and its features stand out like a garment. So you, I I just picture you know. Garments like fabric was like rolling hills and exactly That's all, the, picture. all the yeah. bunches and you know I stayed up late once around a campfire and with a bunch of neighbors in Telegraph Creek and we were just in mm. a really great conversation and and the nights were short in the summer right like it got dark at like eleven and it got light at like two. Mm-hmm. Or one, I can't remember exactly. So you just had this little short period. It was later in the year, like it was towards the fall. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, for a while there, our fire was low, and it was getting darker and darker and darker. And every time somebody would have to get up and pee, because <laughs> many of us did, you know, they'd walk. You know, in the beginning when it was still light, they'd walk way out and then behind a, a tree, yeah. or something, right? 
and and then the darker it got, the le- the, fr- the less further everybody went. Yeah. You know, and then it started to lighten up again, and then people started going further. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you're walking, and, and it was in our like it was on our property. We were a little away from the house, but it was a familiar way. And um, I went back early, like they, you know, some of them stayed up longer, but I went back in the dark and I was falling all over the place. Every little rise, you know, and your foot's not ready yeah. for it, you know, and you, <laughs> it's just crazy how, how much everything changes in the dark, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then just a place. little bit of light, you just get a little bit of love, a silhouette, and then suddenly you can make your way smoothly, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're not just like plowing into like a little hillside Mm -hmm. with your foot falling on your face and Mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, like there's so many different interpretations of this because you can read it like as we're talking about it, but you can also talk about this as, as consciousness, like consciousness brings light onto the world. And like, and like, as God fills you with light, yeah. Like you're able to see the features. Like there there's like you know Does a it, dawn inside of you and in, in your this is this is But it lightens up the world too then, right? Like cuz that's kind right. of what it's saying. Yeah, it sheds light. Oh, yeah, interesting. The inside yeah. and the outside in that in in that way of looking at it is it's, it means yes. the same thing. Yes. The sun mm-hmm. rises up and and you're conscious now of all the things that are happening in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um and um yeah there's a lot of things like that like the bolt of lightning later bolt of lightning is an insight as well as a bolt of lightning it is something that's that's uh seemingly random but has a a specific path it takes you know um yeah so yeah the 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 poetry is so dense and everything's so woven together like we're we're like barely scratching the surface (laughs) <laughs> some of this okay we need a hebrew scholar to go with through the book of job with us one more time i know that'd be so fun wouldn't that be great even just like the wisdom poem and then god's speech yeah 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 just that shout you know we're we're calling out to any <laughs> hebrew scholars who would like to hebrew scholars <laughs> try this with us put All up right. the and then, so it's changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. So the light to the wicked is darkness. Mm-hmm. So he's taken away their light, which is darkness, which is what kind of what Job was saying in, in that excerpt I just read. Mm-hmm. And then their uplifted arm is broken, which would be their strength, their ability to lift up their yeah. arm. Um, the thing that strikes you down too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this is, I don't know how many times God mentions the wicked. It's not much. This is one of them. Okay. Um, and he's the answer up to it is light is daylight consciousness right. of in enla- enlightenment in this broader sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not so. Um, okay. Verse 16, have you entered into the springs of the sea or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Mm. Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Okay, so, all right. The expanse of the earth. So from the very beginning, like we were talking about in ancient cosmology, everything comes out of the sea. Yeah. Um, so the springs of the sea, this is the thing is like, where did the spring, where did the sea come from? Where's the source of the sea? The recesses of the deep are the trenches of where the sea, the deep emerged. Yeah. Okay? So have you seen those? And these would be at the very beginning of time. So he's when he's saying, have you entered the springs of the sea? He's saying, like, have you been to the very beginning of time? Right. And then in the next verse, he says, have you seen the gate of death been revealed to you? Now we're going to the very end, the very end of the future. Right. The gates of death where everything passes through them. 
um, have you seen the gates of deep darkness? And and both of those hint at something. There's something further down in the spring and the recesses of the deep uh, of the sea. So there's mm-hmm. something even further back than the beginning. And then the gate of death is like there's something beyond the gate as well. Mm-hmm. So we have these two limits of what we can comprehend, which is like the beginning and end of time. Right. And he's like, those are also portals to other places as well. Mm-hmm. And then he says, have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? So it's, it's, it's just so huge. <laughs> just like, yeah, like he, 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 he's busting through both ends of, of finiteness of time. Right. He he's busting through both ends, the beginning and the end. Mm-hmm. It's like he's blowing out the wall and saying, Oh, look, there's more there's more on that side and there's more on that side. Right. Um yeah, cool. Okay. Verse 19, he says, Where is the way to the dwelling of light? Where is the place of darkness? Um let me Uh, Let me read something first from what Job says in Job 9, because this also has something to do with some other other things that we're going to read. So this is Job. Um, This is when he talks about the arbiter. But right before that, he's talking about creation. He says... uh, Nine what? Let's see. Let's read 9, 4. He says, he's talking about God. Mm -hmm. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. He who removes mountains and they know it not, when he overturns them in his anger and shakes the earth out of place and its pillars tremble. Who commands the sun and it does not rise? Who seals Mm -hmm. up the stars? Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? Who made Bear and Orion and Pleiades in the chambers of the south? Who does great things beyond searching out and marvelous things beyond number? Um, so it contrast, Job is talking about the mountains being overturned. Yeah. Pillars being shaken. Um commanding the sun not to rise and and now god is talking about yeah exactly that establishing the pillars um uh commanding the sun to rise Mm -hmm. um and uh and yeah it's 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 the there's a contrast there yeah 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 it okay. seems like the whole it almost seems like the whole chapter 38 is a, a reflection on that chapter uh nine close to it anyway yeah but this is this is kind of what what i think is meant by god's answering out of the whirlwind there's all this speech that's being back and forth between him and his friends Mm -hmm. but there's things that that it talk it talks about in the wisdom poem that god gives weight to the wind right right and 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 so there's certain things that yeah there's certain phrases and stuff that carry more weight yeah but but as you can see like job said that but god returns it in an opposite manner but it's 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 like that portion of the wind (laughs) in these conversations that had weight to it that all of a sudden God is um, speaking back. I don't know if you're going to get to cha- uh, verse 11 of that chapter 9, but... Oh, go ahead and read it if you want to. He says, Lo, he goes by me, and I see him not. He passes on also, but I perceive him not. I mean, that just sounds exactly like <laughs> what happens to Moses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Yep. He goes by me and I see him not. He passes on also and I perceive him not. Like if 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 what Moses gets to see is 
um, what do you call it? The, the energies, then it's, it's not necessarily what Moses wants to see. Right. I wants to see mm -hmm. him. So he goes by me, but I don't see him. You know, I can't perceive him. Like mm -hmm. I, I want to see that human shape, you know, because mm -hmm. I think that's what we look for. Like that poem that I read, um, you know, that in every rock, and I don't know if I read it here or not, but I, I'm going to read it really quick because it feels like that to me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, oh, come on. I hope I have it. Sometimes I think I have things and I don't have them. Anyways, the poem is, is, it's, it's like all that man sees is man. Um, oh yeah. Remember that one? Yep. Actually, I think that's in, uh, I think George MacDonald has that. Um, I can find it here. Okay. Just keep talking while I look because it's going to take me a minute. Okay. So pressing on to verse 19, where is the way to the dwelling of light? <clears throat> and where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory, that you may discern the paths to its home. Um, this is similar to the separation of darkness and light in, in Genesis when God separated the light from the darkness. And, um, but here he's talking about that there's a dwelling place for light and a place where darkness is. And, and so you get a sense of um, kind of what I was talking about in terms of like um, what um, was in the Ethics of Beauty book when he's talking about the world opening up and then the trauma having a place to live within a bigger world so it's not all consuming. Um, you almost get a sense like the light and darkness are their own <clears throat> beings that, that have their own homes and their own territories. Yeah. And and then God as as adds this sarcastic statement in verse twenty one where he says, "You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great." <laughs> um, <laughs> but part of me is like, kind of like, uh, it's sarcastic, and then it's also like, maybe it's telling us something about the centrality of of humanity. Um, right. And, in these things so both and yep well there's a lot of both and here right mm -hmm. i mean because, it, because it's multivalent oh shoot i i can't find this if i find it's it right. if i find it all well it's it's, just, it's actually really perfect <laughs> to what you're talking about i know <laughs> anyway I'm getting distracted looking for it, so I'm going to stop. You're fine. Okay, so verse 22. Have you entered the storehouses of snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? Yes, um, hail, hail always comes as trouble, let me, let me tell you. As a farmer, yeah, <laughs> hail is trouble. Yeah. And which I have reserved for the time of trouble for the day of battle and war. What is the way to the place where the light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Um, the, the storehouse of hail and stuff, Chesterton talks about it in terms of, of um, to planning for and storing up hail for for like some sort of final judgment on 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 the wicked and evil and evil itself in the very end um i don't know if that's it, it's not completely obvious to me it's part of this i don't quite know what to make of um well it's a poem right i mm -hmm. mean i don't i don't know if every if you can really you know, there's a context in poetry too, right? Yeah. Like the body itself, the form and, and where it's sitting. Um, 
and you know anyway like it, it, i don't know if you can just go like letter by letter verse by verse kind of thing yeah i know that a lot of people would argue with that but um w- what ends up happening is you is you is you lose the you know mm-hmm. the bigger picture right sometimes Okay, so who has a, has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is in a desert in which there is no man? This cleft, there, there's a connection here with the wisdom poem because he talks about the the chan, the the ways in which he channels the rain, um, right. and then the way for the thunderbolt, which is. You know, which psychologically that's, that's the insight, as well as yeah, okay. Um, but it, it's to bring rain on a land where no man is, and in a desert where there is no man, to satisfy yeah. the waste and desolate land, to make the ground sprout with grass. This, this to me is care again, on God's part. Like you know, you're not the center of the universe, buddy. Like mm-hmm. I, it rains where you don't exist. Mm-hmm. Where where you've never been right i'm doing things that you have no idea about <laughs> yeah but it's also it's also like um you know there's that saying you know if a tree falls in the forest does anybody hear i i just re- resent it i resent that statement so much <laughs> because it sounds so arrogant to me it's like what as if you're the only thing that really matters right like that's how i hear that Uh you know and and it seems to me like god's saying here you know i it rain i cause it to rain on the earth where there where no man is and the wilderness wherein there is no man okay so Mm -hmm. like everything is equally important to me you don't have to be there for me to care for it Mm -hmm. okay i care Mm -hmm. for it even when you're not part of the landscape right that's what that says to me to satisfy the desolate and waste ground and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth like i care he cares mm-hmm. god cares and it also reminds me of, like later on he's going to talk about the the wild donkey and the wild donkey is living in that area in the desolate land and the and the wild donkey searching for every green thing, and who's who's bringing the rain there to make those little things sprout? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay. So then he says, "Has has the rain a father who has begotten the drops of dew? More of this, like this familial relationship with creation. This- which is which is just I just really want to bring this home." Like, let's tone it down. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's not talk. Let's not have this being in a booming, you know, angry old man from mm-hmm. the, in the sky voice. Okay. Let's tone it all down and, and let's hear it in the words of a father to right. his son. Right. Okay. A mentor to his student. You know, right. It's it. This is all about like God here to me is talking in very, Caring, loving language, you know, carrying the ocean in its little swaddling clouds. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you need to make an animation of that, Jess. I know, a little <laughs> wrapped and, up in and, 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 you know, caring about the bud of the tender herb, you know, it's like to satisfy the desolate and waste ground to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. The other day, I went for a walk on our property and it was, mm-hmm. I was in this little, forest it's pretty heavy forest and it was dark in there and i could see i was walking towards it and i it stood out so it was a yellow flower and it was about five feet off the ground and i'm like what what is that because i've never seen a a a yellow flower five feet off the ground in the forest before Mm -hmm. okay so i thought oh maybe it's a weird vine because i could see it in the distance and my eyes are dim right yeah and and so I walk over and it's this, we have these, they're not a weed, like my animals eat them all, they they love them actually, but they're like a yellow, they're not a daisy, but they're just a tall yellow flower that grows in the meadows. Mm-hmm. 
And it was one of those. It was very familiar to me. I don't know the name of it. I wrote that poem about it the other day. The, the ones in front of my in front of my outhouse. But this was in the woods. And so this this flower had crawled up the trunk of the tree. And it was because it was fragile, because it didn't have a lot of sunlight. It needed something to lean on to grow, okay? So it climbed up this tree and then it curved around like this. Yeah. And then the 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 flower the stem went up and on the top was the was the head. <laughs> And it was right in the sun. Just found like a little spot beam. of sunlight. <laughs> there was <laughs> one beam, beam of sunlight. And it found right it. there. And this thing had climbed like with this thin, spindly, yeah, you know, yeah. stem around the tree. And I looked at it and I said, "Peekaboo, sunshine." <laughs> <laughs> because that's what it was doing. It was just like. You know, just <laughs> picking it up, just like he's, you know, he's gonna get maybe his thirty-four minutes of sunshine, right? Right. There. That's well, it. That beam was right there. Yeah, that's fun. And it, you know, God sees His creation that way. Mm -hmm. They're all little children to Him, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. From whom's womb did the ice come forth? Who gave birth to the frost of heaven? Oh, that would hurt. <laughs> well, whoever's given birth to it, that is one stout-hearted person. <laughs> I won't say the word I was going to say. <laughs> oh, man. You the waters become hard like a stone in the face. Well, it'd be the me. ice queen from Narnia. Let's say that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Um, but again, like the, the, the creation, the birthing, the fathering, yeah. the, be, the wow. drops of dew are begotten. Like I this know. is not a world the where rain God has is. a father. Yeah. The rain has a father <laughs> <laughs> who writes his poetry. It's crazy. Yeah. But, but I mean, it's like here, here you have the mother of, of the ice, yeah. but you like, and the frost. Who the hell is the mother of ice? Like she's <laughs> gonna be like the like a terrible person. <laughs> you yeah, know? but so so much care. Right, but but in that she has a <laughs> child and like exactly what you're talking about. But know, but as far yeah. as like from from our point of view, it could be something it is so wild and 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 you know well, sort of beyond know, us. Okay, so that this is a good point to point out. Uh, a good time to point out that God says, who is this who's darkened counsel mm -hmm. by words without knowledge? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we're like, oh, the ice queen from Narnia. I said that, right? I think of some cold, hard, yeah, you know, <laughs> B word. Right. <laughs> and And then we think of God coming down and yelling. Mm -hmm. And we're obscuring by that. We're obscuring this, mm -hmm. right? If we do that, because we don't, we're not, we're not actually seeing all of the of the nurturing and the care and the love for a creation that God mm -hmm. actually has. That's mm -hmm. why I keep wanting to say, just tone it down, mm -hmm. tone it down, because because if you don't, it's obscured. Yeah, like God says. Yep. Who's who's obscuring my I my wish. work here? Yep, like, I'm doing stuff, and you're obscuring it with all this right projection, basically. Can you bind up the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? <clears throat> so now, now we we're going up into the constellations, um, and the Pleiades are stars that are really tight together. They're like I know sometimes they look like just one star because they're all like yeah. Phew. So he's talking about can you bind up the Pleiades with chains? So can you bring them all together? And then can you loose the cords of Orion? And Orion famously has that belt that sort of mm -hmm. stretches those three stars. That was like the first constellation I learned when I was a kid. I was like my mom was like, "There's Orion. You can see his belt." Yeah, and like, he's so he stands out so beautifully in the winter time. Yeah, and so and I think even Orion is pulling back yeah. a bow. 
Um, yeah. in, in you have to have eyes to see that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but this know, idea totally. of loosening. And you can see his bow. Right. You actually can see his bow. You can see his elbow mm-hmm. and his bow. And his bow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His but, he, but he's all and spread out. He was about to loose yep. this. And then the Pleiades are bound. And so he's like, can you bind those? Can you loose Orion? And then can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? What's that? So this is this is probably the the zodiac. The oh. the so the I mean ancient people used the 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 twelve like they had different conceptions, but they were basically the same because they correspond with the seasons. Yes, as, of course. as the earth goes around the sun so they noticed that at different times of the year um you'd have different constellations where the sun would rise and and whatever area the sun was rising in you know told you something about what time of the year you were in right and and so like you, you think of the sun uh governs the time of of day so the moon governs the time of a month, you know, from full moon to new moon to full moon is about mm-hmm. one month. And then the Masoreth, the the procession of the stars, right, um, is what Dick is 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 the um, measure of a year. A year. So, yeah. so when it's talking about leading forth the Masoreth, it's it's this procession because like if if you watch the stars which none of us see the stars anymore i um, do you can see the star i see them all the time yeah i went i went out my backyard i was up really early yesterday morning and i looked up at the moon and the moon's pretty bright so there's Mm -hmm. not many stars out i can't really see any stars but there's one super bright star next to it i'm like like i bet that's venus or mercury or or, uh mars because usually Venus or Mars are pretty bright, but I, yeah. I got my little app and I looked it up and I was like, it was Jupiter. Jupiter like you could just oh, see Jupiter just like blazing. Blazing. Oh, yeah. interesting. It was just right there next to the moon. And the moon was like more than half full. So yeah, <clears throat> we, actually anyway. just, we actually just went through, interestingly enough, I think on the 15th, it ended. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the, um, what do they call that? Meteor shower of the Pleiades. Oh, really? So it, the reason they call it that is because it comes from that direction. Mm-hmm. And um, but it's like a regular thing. Yeah, it's every year. Mm-hmm. Um, there's another one. I can't remember the name of it. I think it's in November. And we always try to watch them, but for some reason, every single year it's cloud, super cloudy here, or we have a full moon. <laughs> you just like ruin and then it. You just don't get to see it. Right. Um. So. Yeah. So if we could see the stars or if I could see the stars, you can see them. If you paid attention throughout the year, you'd notice the constellations move as, you know, as the earth is moving around the the sun. And so mm-hmm. every year the constellations do a full 360. So that's the Orion is really Nazareth. great that way, uh, Jess, because you, you know, like I see Orion right out my front door in the mm-hmm. wintertime. And mm-hmm. of course it's dark earlier too, right? Mm-hmm. but in the you know the summer months he's behind my house where i never go out that way really you mm-hmm. know like especially not at night and mm-hmm. um so for me orion is very comforting i love orion because he comes back with the the harvest mm-hmm. you know when i feel like my life is full mm-hmm. and i'm good i'm and and it's cooling off and you start to like when you live on a farm you work really hard all summer long. And then in the fall, you're really, you're really quite tired and you really look forward (laughs) to winter because then you can't go outside anymore. As long as you can, you do. Okay. Right. You just have to. And, and then the winter time, you're like the first signs of, you know, winter and the garden is done. It's not growing anymore. Everything has Mm -hmm. to come in and, you know, and then there's Orion and, and it's just this cozy feeling. To me, right, you're like here's Orion coming. The oh, Orion's back, you know, and yeah. and it's getting darker earlier. And mm-hmm. you make a fire in the wood stove, and you smell mm-hmm. the smoke outside, and it's crisp. Mm-hmm. And there's just something mm-hmm. really wonderful about that. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. 
And, and that, I mean, that's how everyone back in those days experienced things. Cause you could see the stars every night and, yeah, you and would, it's, you would build it a relationship you, with them. Is, like I, that. Yeah. It tells you something like, mm-hmm. and, yeah, I, and, and the, I, and I actually greet Orion. Like when I go out, you know, I'm like, Hey, you're back, you know, every yeah. evening. Cause yeah. I have to go do chores in the evening. Right. So yeah. I go feed and stuff. Yeah. That's just nice. And then it says, or can you guide the bear with its children? And the bear is not a live bear. It's the constellation. It's the so, constellation. Yeah, yeah, it's Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. Um, Probably. Mm-hmm. So do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you establish their rule on earth? Okay, so this is this idea of the ordinances of heaven. Like, so, so the sun governs the day. The moon governs, like, the month. Um, the, the, uh, the, the Masoret, the Zodiac is governing the, the seasons of the year. And, and so this is, then it's asking the question, do you know the ordinances of heaven and came So like, there's these yeah, heavenly know. patterns. Yeah. Okay. Like literally heavenly patterns that are shaping things yeah. and ruling on earth. The sun, when it comes up, rules the, <laughs> the earth. And when it goes down, and and the the moon with with the tide and the is this, um, do you think this has something to do with on earth as it is in heaven? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And and so there's there's a yeah there's a relationship there, and then um, you know so so God's just pointing this out this this huge thing that goes on that that um. Like I said, it's just part of the world is opening up again to Job. Mm -hmm. We'll get through to like verse 38 and then we'll call it quits. Okay. Sounds good. And we'll stop just before we get to the lion and all the animals. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So 34 says, can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may... They may go and say to you, here we are. Mm -hmm. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts and given understanding to the mind? So like, why is he talking about clouds? Then he's talking about lightning. Then he's talking about wisdom and understanding because like the, the clouds and the, and the water, like, yeah. And then the lightning that's all talking about wisdom and understanding Mm -hmm. um, and how it comes down on you. And yeah. what it produces in you, and and the, the the lightning of how it it produces insights, and you'll have aha, like and things start to day. come together, and <laughs> like what? Like I had the other day. I know, about, right? It was just like yeah. wham, yeah. It's it's like a whole it monsoon like came to you, and like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still tired from it. So. And then it says, who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can tilt the water skins of heaven? Like, can you, can you manufacture those things? Can you manufacture an insight? Can you manufacture uh, the way that, that you grow and become and. That, that seems to go back to that whole measuring and uh, like the rationality thing, mm-hmm. you know, numbering and quantity. Right? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Can you count? the clouds and then and then tilt the water skins yeah you know make it rain (laughs) yeah and then bill gates Gates can (laughs) (laughs) they're they're seeding the clouds with apparently aluminum and magnesium whatever they're doing (laughs) lord have mercy all right and then he says okay so can you tilt the water skins of heaven when the dust runs into a mass and the clods stick fast together so this is for me this is hinting at like or it makes me think of the creation of man from the dust so here we have the heavenly rain come down and then then the the dust forms into a mass and sticks together into a um but i may be um i i don't know like if you were talking about before how it's like like it's describing consciousness right it's describing insight and knowledge from above um 
And when I read that, something that grows into hardness and cleaves fast together, like those are like for me as living on a farm, mm-hmm. you don't want the dust to grow together in hardness. You don't want that to happen. And you don't want the clods to, to cleave close together. Like, oh, really? You want the, you, no. You want the earth to be moist enough. Like this to this to me is oh, dry right. and hard. Okay. And and then it's un, it becomes unproductive land when that happens, right? Hmm. You want it to I, at least this is how I see, I don't know um what the Hebrew says there if that's really well, what Let it's, me read another part where it talks about this this is w- one of the things about Job is there, there's sometimes words that are only used in two one or two places. Okay. And and so when when a word is only used twice like I kind of pay attention. I'm like, oh, it's used, especially if it's used in God's speech and it's used somewhere else. I, I like to look up where else it was used. So this is that the word clods is also used in Job 21, 33. Um, okay. I'll read a little bit before that. Let's see. I'm just going to start at 27, which is a little bit of ways away. But behold, this is, this is Job um, speaking. To his friends, he says, behold, I know your thoughts and your schemes to wrong me. For you say, where is the house of the prince and where is the tent in which the wicked lived? Because Job just talked about how the wicked prosper. Right, right. Have you not asked those who travel the roads? Do you not accept their testimony that an evil man is spared in the day of calamity when he is rescued in the day of wrath? Who declares his way to his face and who repays him for what he has done? When he is carried to the grave, watch is kept over his tomb. Okay, now this is where... um, Uses the word. Yeah, he says, The clods of the valley are sweet to him. All mankind follows after him. And those who go before him are innumerable. What what is the Hebrew? Do you know what the Hebrew is there? The Hebrew word is regeb, which... um, It it just means the clods. (laughs) But um, the clods? clods of the valley. Like, okay, so if I understand this properly, now I don't know what an ancient clod is, okay? But when you till up soil for the first time, mm-hmm. it's you have the, you'll see it in the fields, big yeah, chunks of dirt, chunks. right? Those are clods. Mm-hmm. And you don't want those to get hard in the right. field. Okay, because what will happen if they dry out and get hard, the ground gets hard, then when the rain hits them, it runs off and it never soaks them because they're clods. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, um, and I imagine if they were tilling up um, ground in ancient times, um, they wouldn't have had like finer tool, like it would have been a lot of work to break up the clods, okay? Okay. Um, so okay, when he so says... Here, here it says here, let me just read this. This is interesting. Yeah. Um, frost is essential for breaking up clods into manageable size pieces. Oh, and we were just talking about the frost. Yes. So, so you would, and you'll often see this, um, you would a turnover, like hard hard turnover of a field in the fall and leave it for the winter. And then right. the frost <clears throat> will break up all those clods for mm. you. You need them broken. Right, right, okay? right, right. That's my whole point. You know, yep. you don't yep. want, like when it says here, dust grows into hardness and clods cleave fast together. You don't want that as a farmer. Yeah. So he, he's all right. So that so, sounds to me like, um, okay. So, because God says here, who can number the clouds or who can stay the bottles of heaven? So there's water pouring out and you don't want that water to hit hard ground or hard clods. Okay. Because it's not mm-hmm. penetrating. It's not soaking it up. It's it's yeah. a waste. It's a waste of the water for one thing, mm-hmm. you know? Um, well, it's like all this is happening, but no one's understanding it. Right. 
Yeah, it's being poured just like, out. Just like the water is coming over the clods, but they're not soaking it in. Yeah, it's being poured okay. out on onto onto land that can't absorb it. Can't absorb it. Okay, because it's right. hard. Well, and that's what he's saying. Like he's like, who has put wisdom in the inward parts? Who has given yeah. understanding to the mind? Can you send yeah. forth lightnings? Can you lift up your voice that a flood may cover you? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. It does. It actually does. Yeah. That's good. I'm I'm glad you <laughs> helped me with that because I was like thinking like, oh, the dust coming together. Maybe this. No, it's not. It's not positive. It's, it's not good. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's poured. It's being poured out onto onto. It's being wasted, literally. Right, that ground is not receiving and won't be. It's not receiving it. Yeah, and and I mean that's how God starts. That's how God starts the chapter. He says, "Who's darkened? Mm -hmm. Right? Who's mm -hmm. obscuring my my thing here? Mm -hmm. You're obscuring it with your with your projection, you know of." What you think I'm doing, and, right. and what is what is it that they think he's doing, Jess? If you look back at all those Eliphaz and Bildad and so far and Elihu, Elihu um, speeches, God is being portrayed as really um, arbitrary, antagonistic, wrathful, um, unpredictable, mm -hmm. super powerful. Okay. And when God describes himself in this chapter, he talks about him. He talks about fatherhood. He talks about wombs. He talks mm -hmm. about birth. He talks about swaddling clothes. He talks about sh tender shoots. Like, I don't see anything. Breaking up the dry ground. He sounds pretty, pretty yeah. nice, pretty caring, pretty gentle, pretty kind compared yeah. to what they have they fear he they, is. They have obscured that. Yeah. They have obscured that vision of God, and they pre present it with their lack of knowledge. They present him as being mm -hmm. this angry, wrathful God. Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying, Jess. Yep. And it gets back to my point. It, it's God is defending himself with the, with the same intensity that Job um, defends his integrity god is defending what he's doing the 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 wisdom and in the and the care and that god is doing everything it's interesting because job gets glimpses of this right he gets a glimpse of the tender shoot that gets a second chance mm -hmm. he gets a glimpse of what was the other thing um life after death that's also a second chance okay? yeah of going into sheol and being remembered Right. So it's like when he says second chance, because that's essentially what he's saying. Oh, maybe I get a second chance. Mm -hmm. Right. They're like, quit Only with that crap. Repeat. Okay. That, that tree is getting ripped out by the roots, man. <laughs> that's what they essentially I say. Okay. Rude. There's no second chances, Job. God's not like that. Well, what is the kind of person, what kind of person gives a person second chances? Mm -hmm. someone who cares about them mm -hmm. who's courageous enough to give them a second chance right mm -hmm. and who also could be misunderstood mm -hmm. and who is humble okay that's god that is who god is that's right and i just you know I'll fight you on that one. <laughs> I'll fight you. Let's go. <laughs> well, I think that's a good note to end part one yes. of God's yeah. speech. Yeah. We'll uh we'll get through all the animals next time. Cool. Um, I love animals, you know that. I love this okay. section, so we'll we'll spend a lot of time on it too. Cool. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thanks again, Sherry. Thank you, Jess.